There's a lot that's unconventional about Kathleen Beinhout. She attended college despite coming from a family that didn't see value in a woman doing so. She became a college professor, then left that career to become a dairy farmer. Then in 2006, she ran for the state Senate, and she defeated an incumbent Republican. Now she's running for governor for the second time, and she's one of eight Democrats in the field. I'm Jesse Opoyan, and this is Wedge Issues, a podcast about the 2018 elections in Wisconsin. I had a great conversation with Kathleen Weinhout, and we covered a lot of ground, from guns to health care to her deep and somewhat unexpected love for Pat Benatar. Stay tuned for all of that. But first, let's look back on what happened in the news this week. Hey, Eric, how's it going? Hey, Jesse, it's going really well. I'm drinking a Diet Coke right now. Uh, So here's my promise to our listeners. I will not belch into my microphone (laughs) because I care. It's the least you can do, really. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome, everyone. Um, but we, we all thank you. I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Jesse appreciates it the most. I do. Um, but um, yeah, let's get to the news of the week. So first of all, let's start off with um, some somber news. Last Friday, Mike Ellis, a former state legislator, previously a Senate president, a longtime Republican, he he died at the age of seventy seven. So Jesse, could you speak a little bit to his passing and? You know, uh, what was his legacy as a a state politician? So Mike Ellis was a state legislator for more than 40 years. He was in the Assembly and the Senate representing Nina and the the Fox Valley region. He decided not to run for re-election in 2014 because he was actually uh, caught on a secret videotape recording talking about some not-so-legal campaign finance activity, all hypothetically, but still um, it was a bit of a scandal for him. But for for years before that, and, and the way he's being remembered now is, just a really dedicated public servant for his district, um, you know, remembered as someone who could push back on leadership or work across the aisle to accomplish things that benefited his constituents and uh, really just sort of, uh, I think, described in, in many cases as a larger than life figure. He was frequently spotted in sunglasses. He was known at one point for breaking a gavel um, because he was so uh, fired up and, and angry during a debate over an abortion bill. Um, so, you know, uh, tributes came through from both sides of the aisle, from those who had worked with him over the years. And uh, certainly uh, most most people who worked with him at any point over the years had a, an amusing anecdote to, to remember him by. Um, let's turn to electoral news. And specifically, let's talk about one of the Democratic candidates running for governor, Matt Flynn, who has had sort of an embattled campaign due to his history working as an attorney in Milwaukee. He represented the uh, Catholic Archdiocese there at a time when the Archdiocese was facing lawsuits due to this history of sex abuse by priests. So this has been something that has kind of been dogging his campaign for, for, a, for a while now. I mean, what's the latest in, in that? So the latest is uh, this week, earlier this week, Matt Flynn held a phone call with reporters. He rolled out a letter from the man who had been archbishop during this time saying that the attorneys, and that includes Matt Flynn, had nothing to do with the reassignment and transfer of priests accused of abuse, that that was the fault of the church, that they were naive in doing so, that they had done wrong and attorneys had nothing to do with it. Um, that you know runs counter to some of the arguments we're hearing from people calling on Matt Flynn to get out of the race. Um, you know They say that he was there, whether it was active or complicit, that he went Uh, above and beyond what was required of him as an attorney representing a client. And they feel that he helped facilitate really this this bad behavior. He argues that those calls are politically motivated and that people are misreading and misinterpreting his uh, professional record. Uh, But what happened at the end of the week is Scott Walker, the governor, called on Matt Flynn to get out of the race. And the Republican Party is arguing that Democrats in the race should join in this call, that they should speak out against him. Only one has done so at this point. Josh Paid, has, and who, who is an attorney himself, has called on Matt Flynn to get out of the race. And Mike McCabe, he's the only Democrat who hasn't pledged to support the party's eventual nominee. He hasn't called on Flynn to get out of the race, but he did say that this 
issue is an example of why he thinks it's a bad idea to make a pledge like that in the first place. Um, but Flynn was the first candidate to get up on TV with an ad talking about his opposition to Foxconn. That's the message that he's hoping to focus on. So, you know, he's been pretty pretty defiant and pretty out front in terms of talking about his history on this. He says he's proud of the work that he did and, and doesn't have any issue talking about it. But obviously, he's hoping to steer this conversation toward Foxconn. Yeah, he's certainly put up a feisty defense when it comes to his history. Feisty is a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finally, let's talk about something cooking up in the legislature. Earlier when we were talking, I described it as um, economic development related, but you pointed out yeah, it's more of a just preserving kind of what has already been there. So we're talking about uh, Kimberly Clark, which earlier this year um, said they would be closing down plants in the Fox Valley region, which, as you might imagine, would result in significant job loss. However, now there is some talk of uh, the legislature taking up an incentives package to prevent that from happening. Yeah, this conversation started in February, I believe. We heard then that Kimberly Clark was looking at shutting down these plants. Uh, Pretty quickly after that, Governor Walker said he was prepared to offer them an incentive package modeled after the Foxconn package. So um, in particular, tax cuts, tax breaks uh, tied to jobs created or retained. He did this because he said both Foxconn and the paper industry were sort of Cadillac opportunities in Wisconsin, um, and and that this isn't something that he would do for just any company, but he would do it for Kimberly Clark. So the Assembly passed that legislation, uh, allowing the state to offer those incentives at the end of the legislative session. But the Senate never took up the bill. It was unclear at the time whether there was enough support for it in the first place, but was all, what was also unclear was whether Kimberly Clark would even accept it. So this week, the union at Kimberly Clark has come to an agreement um, offering concessions that would allow them to move forward with this, but it hinges on Kimberly Clark receiving that state assistance. And that hinges on the Senate passing the legislation. The Senate would have to come in uh, out of its normal calendar to do that. And it's still not clear whether the votes are there for that to pass. Um, We're still figuring that out. But Governor Walker has signaled that he would be just as happy to sign that legislation now as he was when he mentioned it in February. Yeah. So the Foxconn incentives package has been a major point of debate in the race for governor. Do you think that this incentive package in any way is going to be part of the conversation there? That's a tough one to to predict. Some of the candidates were asked about this at the time that the legislature was considering it. And I believe at the time, Malin Mitchell actually said if this were before him, if he were in, in the legislature, he would probably vote for it. And I think the, the difference in the way that candidates might talk about this is that Foxconn, those jobs are being promised to be created. They don't already exist in this state. And Democrats can question, well, will they ever come here? And what will those jobs look like? But when it comes to these Kimberly Clark jobs, that's 600 jobs uh, at a company that has a long history in Wisconsin that's a really important part of that community in that area. And it's harder to criticize that. Um, But what we will hear from really both sides of the aisle, because there are some Republicans who are opposed to this, is the the question of is does does this set a standard based on Foxconn of when a company is thinking about leaving can they just ask the state to come help them out and that's I think the precedent that people want to stay away from. Well, let's wrap things up. Um, belch count zero. So I proud held of you. My promises. We all yeah. thank you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no problem. So coming up is your interview with Kathleen Feinhout. Um, It's a really compelling interview. Yeah, thanks for having me as always, Jesse. Thanks, Eric. Let's hear from Kathleen Feinhout now. You've run before, you ran in the recall, you almost ran, came close to running in 2014. What from those previous campaigns has shaped the way that you're approaching this run now? And what do you see as common threads from that? And and maybe what's changed in the state since you last did this? I ran in 2012 as kind of a getting acquainted campaign. Mm -hmm. I didn't have statewide name recognition. I had a a lot of folks knew me in the West and and the North, but not so much in the Southeast. I didn't have to give up my Senate seat. The, the recall, there was a lot of energy and a lot of folks that uh, wanted to get involved. And 
In 2013, uh, the the car accident that shattered the lower part of my upper arm uh, happened in December. It was it was a very different environment because the then party chair had really made the decision that there was one person that was going to run and it wasn't me. And there were a lot of, a few people that were actively trying to get me out of the race. This race, we started planning uh, last summer. I knew that this was for all the marbles. This was, this, this was winter go home and, and uh, go home was, is going to be the end of my public career. I came into the legislature with no money, no public experience, no name recognition in a race that nobody thought I could win in 2006. I won by 2,000 votes and we won by turning more people out to the polls in my little county of 13,000, counting the dogs and the cats, we, we ended up with 800 more votes. And my opponent got about the same that he had gotten when he ran before. And the answer was to turn out more people. And that's been our strategy all along, is to focus on people who don't usually vote, but when they do vote, they vote Democratic. It's, it's a very different approach. And from the very beginning, our strategy was to engage these people. Uh, it, it, the slogan, people first, it, it represents me and who I, what I've done in the 12, or almost 12 years I've been in the legislature, but it also speaks to those people who might not vote in a Democratic primary or might not vote in an off-year election to bring those people and engage those people and doing what needs to be done to actually put people first. I mean, what does that mean from a policy standpoint, from a proposal standpoint, and how is that different from your opponents in this field? Well, it means putting health care first. It means changing the school funding formula. It means things like free tuition and in two-year end tech colleges. It means for my part of the state in the north and actually a lot of rural spots in the southeast, it means getting broadband to everyone. It means taking the Medicaid expansion money and investing in that $286 million that's freed up in mental health and addiction recovery services that are community-based. Uh, it means alternatives to incarceration. Why is it that we have twice as many people as incarcerated as Minnesota does? I've written an alternative to the governor's budget since 2011. I have fully funded programs like Alternatives to Incarceration. And when you ask how am I different from other candidates, there's nobody else that has the policy details. You mentioned you took a, an unusual path from your first campaign for governor. You, you didn't have a lot of name recognition. You, were, you, you took an unusual path into the Senate by beating an incumbent that didn't, people didn't mm -hmm. think you were going to beat. And you came from that as a dairy farmer, right? I was a full-time dairy farmer for 10 years. And you didn't grow up as a dairy farmer. No. You started a dairy farm. I did. That's unusual, too. <laughs> if you're not born into it or marry into it, it's super hard to get started farming. And, and I often would joke that I became a university professor and got my PhD so that I could get the resources that I needed to start my farm, which is, again, kind of a long, hard way to go there. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, I, I went back to school as a professor and went back to the tech college and got a degree in agriculture. It was kind of fun because I was in my late 30s and everybody in class was was 18 and, and I was female, the only female, and they were all male. But I, I had a lot of fun and I, I, I'm passionate about it agriculture. I love agriculture. So we shared that passion even over the gender age divide. Yeah. I interned on a, on a dairy farm for quite a long time. I took my spring breaks and my summers and long weekends and worked. I got up at 4 a.m. and worked in, at the farm and milked cows and learned how to fix tractors and how to how to bring in hay and how to deal with sick cows and how to buy cattle. I, I ended up, you know, buying all the cattle and one by one or two by two. The day when I left teaching, I, I wasn't feeling very good. And I stopped at the doctor and I was going to pick up uh, the dog and the cat. And then we had a, 
a guy who's helping me move the 40 pregnant heifers. <laughs> and I found out at the doctor appointment that I was pregnant. No, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am driving to this new farm, ready to unload these 40 heifers, saying, I got a little bambino there. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, how is this ever going to work? <laughs> but we did it. <laughs> so you started a farm and a family at the same I time. I did. I did. Wow. <laughs> Uh, my son's now 20, almost 23, so wow. <laughs> he, grew, he was born and bred on the farm, but not so much for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, that may tie into, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you can think of a significant obstacle in your life that you've overcome and, and how you did that, and, and maybe that was making the jump from that, or maybe it was something else. Well, I, I've, I've, had, I've had a lot of obstacles in my life. Um, my dad was uh, dug ditches for a living, and he was a union laborer. He finished cement, and my mom was sick. She had um, liposarcoma, and it reoccurred six times. And eventually, later in my life, she died of pancreatic cancer. So she was constantly in and out of the hospital, and it was very serious. And we thought she was going to die when I was young, maybe seven or eight. She had five kids under five, and I was the oldest. So very, very, very young. <laughs> I had a lot of responsibilities. Yeah. And my dad, uh, God bless him, he believed that college would be wasted on a girl, so mm. he wouldn't sign my financial aid papers. It was hard. Our, our family, we had enough, but it was barely enough sometimes. So it would have really helped. So I became an independent student, and I worked my way through college. I, I was a nurse's aide for five years. I started working when I was 14 and, and kept working most of the time through college and then got a few other odd jobs. Maybe maybe it was my pride that I've had to to learn how to deal with because I very much wanted to prove my dad wrong. Sure. So I got I finished my degree in education. I student taught. I taught five classes of fifteen year olds health. My degree was in health education, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is really the hardest job I've ever had. Even harder than <laughs> milking cows or being a nurse's aide is being a teacher of fifteen year olds. Ah, I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went on to grad school, got my master's degree in public health at the med school at. at St. Louis University and then got my PhD in health services research and became a full-time professor. And it was hard because at the beginning, that wasn't a path that my folks thought a, a woman should travel. Yeah. And my sister became a nurse and it was like, be a nurse or be a teacher. And of course, I'm 60, so this was the dark ages. <laughs> but I, I think that eventually, my mom never saw, lived to see me become senator, but my dad did. And he came to the inauguration in 2006 and, or 7 in 2010, 11. And he was very, very proud of me. And, and just working through that, I'm not good enough I think that a lot of women struggle with, I'm not good enough. I think that was one of my biggest obstacles. And when folks say, why aren't there more women in the legislature? Why aren't there more women running for office? It's, I think it's really important that people be sensitive to the subtle uh, social pressures that still exist in our society yeah. that says that women aren't good enough. It's so important, those of us that want women to run, to say, help me help you find that inner confidence. Yeah. And whatever it is, that's that little voice nagging at the back of your head that says, I want to do this, but I'm scared. Tell me about your pathway from <laughs> the several career changes to then running for public office. What gave you the confidence to do it, and why did you want to? Well, I had I had been teaching in the health policy field. My a PhD is in health services research, and my sp a specialization was the organization of the healthcare system. And then I became a farmer. I became a mom. I, I spent 10 years full-time dairy farming, and one day we were leaning over a, a sick cow, and it was October of 2002, and, and we were listening to the radio, my veterinarian and I, and we got to be close, and he taught me a lot about taking care of the cows. We heard a political ad, and he, he turned to me, and he said, you're so much smarter than they are. You really ought to think about running for the Senate. And it was the first time in my life I had ever crossed my mind, and I looked at him, I said, oh, you're just crazy. That's just nuts. I love dairy farming. I love what I'm doing. Yeah. 
And then the price of milk went to hell. The last time the price of milk dropped really low because we're in a big crisis right now. Yeah. And we had to make that difficult decision to drop our health insurance or to sell the cows. And of course, all of my cows, I know, you know, their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents, and they're all named. And I know all the details about their health history. And they're just my, my family. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sell the cows. So we dropped really expensive, really awful health care coverage. And we were without health care for about two, a little less than two years. And I took that call that no mom ever wants to take, which is your son has to have emergency surgery. Mm -hmm. And by now he's about nine or so. And three scars later and a $15,000 bill, we had to take out a second mortgage on the farm. And my neighbors had a similar issue, but they didn't have the equity. A lot of them didn't have the equity in their farm, so they weren't able to do it. And they did end up having to sell the farm. And I, I was just very much nagged by this whole process of having to give up the health insurance and try to figure it out and, and helping my neighbors trying to figure it out. And so I ran with the major platform of bringing health insurance to everybody that was affordable and, and high quality. That issue resonated with so many people that weren't usually involved with politics. One issue that I think looms over this election is how and to what degree the government should be involved in, in regulating guns. And this is an area where you differ a little bit with some of your Democratic colleagues. Can you just talk about your perspective on guns? What informs that and what you think is the, the appropriate approach and how you're different from your colleagues on that? My parents were both in the military. They were both in the United States Air Force. My mom hated guns and my dad loved guns. And my mom, my grandfather, was killed in, in um, gun violence. And so from her and from her family, I learned the multi-generational effects of gun violence. My dad, he became a gunsmith later in his life when he retired from digging ditches and finishing concrete. And he really taught me how to handle a gun, the love of the shooting sports. And I grew up in a house with that tension. And on both sides, it's very, very emotional. And I tried in the Senate to take that experience and find common ground. So I, for example, supported conceal and carry. I support being able to protect your home, but I don't support the Florida-style stand-your-ground legislation where the young man was killed, Trayvon Martin was killed. So I think that there's a middle ground that we can find with this. There are a few policies that I think are very important that we started as a state to begin to deal with right away. Uh, one of them is universal background checks. And so what I did was put together an alternative that became an amendment that the Democrats introduced in the Senate near the end of the legislative session. Mm -hmm. And the amendment would use the Department of Justice, whose records are a little bit better than the NIC system, the National Instant Criminal Background Check system. Yeah. And the idea is that you would get preauthorization for a, maybe a 30-day period or a 15-day window. And that background check then you could use to go to a private sale or to go to a gun show and say, hey, here's my background check, and the other person could, could take that. There, there would be a record of it. Near the very end of session, this lot of issues related to firearms came up that were kind of tangentially related to the governor's ideas on giving money to schools for school safety. Mm -hmm. And the Republicans actually took part of that idea and talked about it in the legislature and the assembly. And to me, that gave me hope that as governor, I could work with the Republicans and say, hey, I I'm not talking about shutting down private sales. I'm talking about protecting the seller as well as the buyer, as well as the entire society. The other thing that comes up, I think, in the race, or one of your other opponents refers to herself as the only pro-choice woman in the race, which is something you've refuted before. But why don't you talk a little bit about why that perception exists and, and why, why you would disagree with that? There are people in this race, unfortunately, that are lying about my record. I have, for a very long time, since I was very young, been pro-choice. My sister 
almost died of a self-induced abortion. My dad um, found her at five in the morning when he was going to get ready for work. That was a huge crisis in our family. She was six months pregnant. Oh, God. So she was very young, and I, I, I feel bad about telling this personal story, but I think I need to tell it because it's really important that everyone, no matter how they feel about this issue, realize that if abortion is not safe and high quality and accessible, women will die. And there's nothing pro-life about that. <laughs> when women die, that's, that's death. Of course, I strongly believe that we need to make unwanted pregnancies rare. And when you think about what this means, they are all democratic issues. So I used to teach. I taught 15-year-olds health education. Yep. I used to teach sex education. And, and we passed a law in, in uh, 2009 that would provide for what we called medically-based sex education, mm -hmm. which, you know, I'm sorry, but... Abstinence isn't on the list as, as effective as that is. Uh -huh. If you actually do it, the problem is actually doing it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's, it's talking to kids about how, how babies come about, how pregnancies happen. Second, health care, universal access to health care. And, and then things like universal access to ch affordable child care so women don't feel like they can't have that fourth baby. Uh -huh. We've talked about your policy priorities and your alternatives. Is there anything in the time that you've been in the legislature that you think Governor Walker has done well or that you would praise? Um, I, I think it's more the legislature than the governor, and it's the ag community. There were a number of farm issues that came up, and it's kind of curious that he's kind of starting to talk about some of these things now because it was actually the legislature that fixed a lot of the things, the Republicans that fixed a lot of the problems. So in the end, I guess I could say I could agree that he did put some money into conservation, which these would be the conservation structures that would protect the topsoil and protect the runoff, you know, stop the runoff. care about this state deeply and these issues are going to be with me for a long time. Us talking about a five-year plan is not helping me. It may be fine for you, but it's not helping me. Now, whether they're from the community, I don't care. Whether they're from space, I don't care. As long as they can provide the best visual experience for Madison. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. These are Cap Times Talks, smart conversations about big topics in Madison. Look for Cap Times Talks on iTunes or anywhere else you find podcasts. Are you ready for the lightning round portion of this interview? Go for it. Okay. Favorite Wisconsin beer? Uh, New Glarus. <laughs> All right. Spotted cow or a different New Glarus? It has yeah. to be spotted yeah. cow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I have to ask you, I, I don't know if you heard about this, but I was like, kind of obsessed with your entrance at the Dem convention when you were lip syncing and getting oh, really into it. Um, we talked that. about it on an episode of this show, Pat, Pat, actually. Pat Benatar is yeah. one of my favorite <laughs> So singers. tell me about the thought. Yeah, why, why was that the song that you chose? And and was it, were you just like in the moment and just like, I'm going to do this? I, I, <laughs> I love Pat Benatar. <laughs> so truth be told, um, I, I suffered child abuse when I was young. And when I heard the song about, and I'm going to blank on its name, um, it, for the children, um, I like I get goosebumps. Pipples just telling you this story. It was like someone wrote a story about my life. Really. And and that was that was like my entrance into falling in love with Pat Benatar. But then again, truth be told, this is like truth, <laughs> truth or dare, girls' slumber party. <laughs> <laughs> I um. I was not on the side in the Senate when the Senate majority Dems voted to have a coup to change leadership. And the faction that supported Senator Robson, the first woman majority leader in the Senate, in the Dem Senate, we lost and Senator Decker became the leader. And that began a, a very long journey of struggle for me. 
And I remember writing on my desk on a pad of paper over and over again, tyranny breeds rebellion, which is a Thomas Jefferson quote. And and that was the the management style of our leader. So then as I drove home on my four-hour drive, because I have four-hour commute from my farm to home, I the the song that became my theme song was Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Oh. <laughs> and I was talking about my Democratic leader. <laughs> And it was a, it was a real struggle, yeah. and that would have been the 0911 budget debate. So, that's my love affair with Pat wow. Benatar. That is deeper than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, it all makes sense now. I had I actually I was not familiar with that particular Pat Benatar song, so but it was stuck in my head for a long time. I know, it was stuck yeah. in my, all fired yeah. up with the song. Yeah. In case anybody wants to go home and right. download yes. it from iTunes, it's an awesome song. It's a perfect campaign song. It's a song that needs to be the theme of all the Democrats until we win and beat Scott Walker. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What's what's the best advice that a loved one gave you growing up? Because my mom was in the hospital so much, I had a very close relationship with my grandmother. I'm named after her. I, I saw the work that she had done, and this is a woman who, you know, in the 1920s, she was a nurse, and she scrubbed, after working all day nursing, she scrubbed floors on her hands and knees at 10.30 at night, then the marble floors of, of Bellevue, which is a huge hospital in, in New York. Yeah. And um, she she basically said, if you work hard and do good, you will be able to achieve what you desire. And for me, that was going to college, which was a huge obstacle. The perception of not being able to afford it was just huge in my mind. I kept track of every penny I spent. I still saved all my records because it was so hard to get through college. It was it was being able to, to teach at the university because, of course, I, I loved the search for knowledge. It was the search for knowledge and wisdom that drove me to go to college. But my tr- my true love was it was the country. I I gr- didn't grow up in the country. We raised rabbits and and uh, chickens in our backyard in the city. But but I really wanted to be. I had my hands in the soil. I was happiest when I had my hands in the soil. And then I knew it was a long shot for me to run in 2006, and I didn't give up. I worked as hard as I could every day, and that's the way that I'm running my campaign for governor. Do you have a a political role model or someone that you try to fashion yourself after? I do. Her name is Judy Whelan. She has passed on to her great reward. She was an organizer for the Farmers Union in the 1950s, and I call her my guardian angel. She taught me rural community organizing in 2006 when I ran. She grabbed my hand and said, come on, we're going to do this, and brought me into the co-op and said, now go say hello to all those men and shake their hands and (laughs) give them one of these things. And she just gave me the confidence in her style as, as an organizer to get out of my comfort zone and talk to people I didn't know. And I remember her all the time, and she's still, she's still with me. Do you have any pet peeves? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I know. Dishonesty is is one of those things that that nags at me and and it's all too common in our political world. We, we just have to open the newspaper and we see other examples of mm-hmm. dishonesty. So if if there's something that kind of just like I have emotional reaction to, I yeah. think it's probably that 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 would be that. Yeah. Um, I know you like to to hunt. Uh, is there do you hunt deer? Do you do you hunt other uh, species besides deer? And uh, what what do you like about hunting? What's your favorite thing to hunt? It is the mindfulness activity of hunting. It is being present in the moment, which. I, I think about so many, and they're mostly guys that hunt, that live very stressful lives and they just live to deer hunt. Yeah. But it doesn't even necessarily mean pulling the trigger and shooting the gun. The whole process of being in the woods, being present to all that's happening in the woods, being a part of the 
ecosystem. And of course, I'm blessed to be able to hunt on our own farm. Yeah. So, you know, I eat the deer that ate our alfalfa. And, you know, just amazing things have happened. I remember once I was working on, working on the budget, the alternative budget, which is a lot of work. And I was so frustrated and I was working at our dining room table. And right outside my dining room window, there was a, a deer having twins. Wow. Like <laughs> 25 feet away. Wow. Th- this is why we live in Wisconsin. This yeah. is this is the beauty of of our uh, of our world and this is why it's so important that we take the right priorities and rearrange using the same dollars showing how to spend the money in a different way a way that puts people first um okay are you ready for your last last sure. lightning round question favorite wisconsin cheese oh i have so many <laughs> you can name more than one i'll allow oh it. my god asiago is one of my favorite i'm a big fan of swiss uh, especially baby Swiss and aged Swiss, but I also loved aged smoked cheddar. Yeah. We used to ship our milk to the Ellsworth Creamery, oh, yeah. and they're uh, farmer owned. They're they're a co op, and there's only about 500 farmers, and they would always bring us cheese when they picked up the milk, and we we ordered it and paid for it, of course, but they yeah, gave us yeah. like a discount. And so no matter how hard things became on the farm with not having enough money to pay the bills, we always had cheese. <laughs> <laughs> there's always a hope if there's there, cheese. There's yeah. always a hope if there's cheese. <laughs> but I also, my, my sister has uh, speaks fluent Spanish and, and she um, works with a lot of Hispanics and she's uh, had um, Hispanic and Boyfriend. husbands and she so she's uh opened my mind to mexican cheese oh I, sure I, yeah. I, I like the uh, queso fresco mm-hmm. which is like crumbly kind of cheese that again like farmer's cheese well i think all cheese this is best if you serve it at room temperature because it really brings out the flavor yeah so i keep telling my husband don't put the cheese in the refrigerator we're gonna <laughs> have it for supper <laughs> so I'm, I'm a really big fan of cheese i could eat cheese three meals a day <laughs> <laughs> i'm with you on that <laughs> good well, thank you for coming in. I will let you offer any uh, parting words you have for listeners. It, it's so important that folks realize that they have power in their own hands to be able to beat the governor. We've struggled as Democrats to beat the governor. And we have an opportunity, but it's not going to be big money. We're never going to have the big money that the Koch brothers have. What we have is people power. We're the party of the people. And we need to embody that spirit of being the party of the people. Thank you for listening to Wedge Issues. Our theme music is Oh, Wisconsin by Loxley. We'll be back with new episodes every Friday, so make sure you're subscribed and you can keep caught up. If you have any feedback for us, you can leave us a rating or review on iTunes or anywhere else you get your podcasts, or you can tweet at me at Jesse Opie or email me at J-O-P-O-I-E-N at madison.com. Tune in next week for a conversation with Mike McCabe. We'll see you then. Wisconsin.